Good afternoon, thank you for a very kind introduction and indeed thank you for inviting me as a guest to speak to this conference. Um, since the June 2016 referendum, we have not yet had a budget for Brexit and in all likelihood, this Wednesday's spring statement will not provide it. The statement, however, on Wednesday should highlight the significant improvement we've seen in the budget finances over the last couple of years despite the prospect of Brexit. <laughs> However, in all likelihood, Wednesday will demonstrate once again that the Chancellor, through his negative comments, sees Brexit as making the best of a bad job, while the independent OBR, who provide the official forecast now, in all likelihood will be wary of what lies ahead. Instead of the Chancellor's narrative, I would say that we should be viewing Brexit as a fantastic future opportunity. And indeed, as has been mentioned in the book that Liam Hannigan and I wrote, we stressed the need to avoid the path that the government has now taken us down. And indeed, unfortunately, it's no surprise that we are where we are. Instead, in the book, as has been touched on in the introduction, we argued for a clean break hence a clean Brexit, outside the single market, outside the customs union, and outside the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. Yeah. Half the book is about how to leave, and importantly, half the book is about what we should do when we leave, hence my being here today about a budget for Brexit. I would say that the last few years have highlighted a number of things. First, I think often overlooked, is that, in my mind, it shows that referenda are only won when the other side concedes defeat. Indeed, in military, or well, in war, uh, people are told the other side has to basically say they've lost. I think that's one lesson we should take, particularly when the establishment, including the government, was on the other side. But also, there are a couple of other lessons from the last couple of years that I think are very relevant for this afternoon's debate. One has been a lack of focus on the future direction of the European Union itself, and in particular on the underlying fundamental problems facing the Eurozone, and I'll come back to those later. And in addition to that, the last couple of years have, in my view, avoided a focus on the domestic economic and financial agenda that should lie ahead. As a result, the intervening two years since the referendum have not proved to be the springboard for national renewal and confidence about Britain's future that they should have been. They could have been this if there had been clear leadership and vision, and if the British political, economic and business establishment had decided to accept the vote and move on. Hardly surprisingly, therefore, the bulk of the British people, regardless of how they voted, want the government to get on with it and deliver Brexit. It is, after all, in the best, longer-term interests of the country. In my view, and as we outlined in the book, I'm not just here to plug the book, um, in my view, success depends on getting three things right. Each of them are independent, but each of them are interlinked and in not in a particular order, but one is our domestic, economic and future agenda. Second is our relationship with the EU, and third is our positioning with the rest of the world, which, as even the European Commission has acknowledged, is likely to account for about 90% of global growth in coming decades. Perhaps unsurprisingly, we have focused too much on the future relationship with the EU. The challenge, and it's a particularly important one this week, is that the challenge with the Prime Minister's so-called deal as it stands is that not only does it not guarantee us a good future relationship with the EU, as John has just touched on, but very importantly and often overlooked, it ties our hands in the future on those two other key areas that I have just outlined on our domestic, economic and financial agenda and on our potential future relationship with the rest of the world. It is bewildering and in some respects depressing set of circumstances. 
That being said, and I make this clear in the referendum, it is difficult to leave something like the European Union that we have been in for over 40 years. We have to accept that there may be some short-term dislocation. <clears throat> Indeed, in the referendum and since, I've talked of a Nike shroosh as a symbol of the likely growth potential. The last couple of years, growth has come in far better than Project Fear, but there's no doubt that some investment plans have been deterred, some have been put off, delayed. And the Bank of England has highlighted this in its recent quarterly inflation report. That being said, and I think we have to accept that, what's also remarkable is how well we have done on investment. Britain is still high up there as a recipient of foreign direct investment, just behind America, and if you look at certain data, behind China as well, but way ahead of Germany and France. <coughs> also, with a financial hat on, one of the most significant developments since the referendum was the decision by all the big tech companies to decide to go ahead with their inward investment in London to make it their tech centre outside of Silicon Valley. So despite Brexit, we continue to see strong investment growth in key areas. And as we all know, despite Project Fear, we've continued to see strong employment growth. While quick wins are always desirable, I think the important thing for us today is to recognise the importance of a long-term strategic vision in order to delete, deliver Brexit. And if I was to focus on the domestic agenda, there are many things I think that we should have done over the last 40 odd years when we were in the EU that we didn't do. And we can't blame Brussels for those. But in the future, as power in theory is returned to Westminster, our politicians should be more receptive to the domestic needs of UK voters. But at the same time, while there are things that we should have done better, we can't overlook the fact that our hands were also tied in many ways that are not fully appreciated. The previous coalition government under Clegg, Cameron and Osborne <laughs> produced a whole series of competency reports about the relationship between the EU and the UK. Having read most of them, what was quite remarkable was how intricate and indeed deeply woven was the EU's ties into the UK. They were impacting many areas of domestic policy people didn't really accept or acknowledge. And that, in my, in my view, helps explain why it's so difficult to leave something like the EU. Our eyes also have been very much focused on the EU without very much focusing on that domestic agenda. The UK is a very imbalanced economy. London, be the rest, is always the focus. But there are many other imbalances that we do need to address in terms of delivering full future potential. The relationships are imbalanced not just between London and the rest of the country, but between coastal and inland areas, urban and rural, homeowners versus those who rent, skilled versus unskilled, and old versus young. But often, I think, our biggest export is our pessimism. Even the European Commission in its once every three years analysis of the 263 sub-regions of the EU, points out that three of the top five are in the southeast of England. Number one is London. Number two is Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire. And in fifth place is East Surrey and West Sussex. We do, however, have a heterogeneous distribution in that the poor performing parts of the UK do badly but the good parts do incredibly well. That's why a budget for Brexit is really needed. Not only is it a clean break, it's about realising a Brexit dividend. And this is where the economics establishment and the economics profession is maybe still, in my view, thinking with a status quo bias on and a groupthink attitude. The economics profession largely tends to view Brexit as something that should be avoided. That's because in economics, when you make a change, there's always a cost to be borne. But I would argue that there are two aspects to the Brexit dividend. Thankfully, the economic, shall we say, establishment, the economics profession is probably a better phrase, 
agree in me, with me on the first one. That first Brexit dividend is a decision for us to better spend the current money that we send to Brussels. Now, you can either use the figure on the side of the bus. I disagreed with that during the referendum campaign. The net figure is far more appropriate, but it is still significant. Now, David Smith, Professor David Smith at Derby University, who I think is sometimes a speaker at these events, um, he's at the high end of how much he thinks we pay. But he talks, he's pointed out in the piece of work last year that if we were to use the amount we give to Brussels to cut VAT or income tax, the choice could be to cut income tax by three percentage points or reduce VAT by two and a half percent. So that's the first part of the Brexit dividend that most people would agree with. The second part, though, is open for debate. The economics profession tends to believe that there is no future Brexit dividend because they believe that the economy will perform poorly outside of the EU. I disagree. But that thinking will be seen in terms of the budget statement on Wednesday. The thinking is this, that basically the economy will perform poorly, trend growth will be lower. Therefore, if trend growth is lower, more of the budget deficit is structural. That means you either have to cut spending or raise taxes. That's how the process of thinking goes. I think that's far too pessimistic. I would see Brexit as delivering not only the first Brexit dividend in fiscal terms, but also the second Brexit dividend in terms of delivering better future growth potential. But it does require us to make the correct economic decisions at home. And they're really about focusing on the four I's. More investment, more infrastructure spending, more innovation, and getting the incentives right. The incentives that are enterprise friendly, business friendly, keeping taxes low, and having smart, sensible regulation as opposed to too much regulation. And this will be particularly important in, in terms of the changing global economy. The world economy is changing in ways in which most people don't really appreciate. I could spend ages telling you about this, but let me just highlight three figures that hopefully give you the story. 32, 62, 87. That's the size of the world economy in trillions of dollars. $32 trillion was the size of the world economy at the beginning of this century. $62 trillion was the size of the world economy the day the financial crisis started just over 10 years ago. $87 trillion was the size of the world economy, according to the IMF, at the end of last year. The global growth picture is really changing, and with the fourth industrial revolution, greater innovation and, I would say, greater changes overseas, we have a great opportunity, if we make the right decisions post-Brexit, to better position the UK economy to succeed in that global picture. Finally, the last part I'd like to highlight is the fact that we haven't looked enough or focused enough on the future direction of travel of the EU. President Macron kindly has highlighted this very clearly. He did it last year when he said that the future for the EU was to have either a core centred on a political union or a core and a periphery where the periphery basically takes the rules and doesn't really, sorry, it basically takes what it's told and doesn't set the rules. Why would we in the UK want to be part of a political union or why would we want to be attached to a periphery that has little say? Last week, he reiterated the message he often got the words European Union and Europe mixed up. Europe apparently is a project. I'd never realised that. I thought it was a continent. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the European Union is very, very different to the EU. Sorry, to the EU is very different to Europe. Indeed, during the referendum, I said the EU was like the Titanic. The Titanic looked, well, naturally it was big. It looked impressive. People wanted to be on it. The day it left Southampton Harbour, people thought it was invincible. It was told to change direction and it refused to do so. It sank. 2016 was the voters' opportunity to tell the politicians to jump off the Titanic. 
The Prime Minister's deal, instead of allowing us to sell off to face the brand new world, which we would have been able to do, is now trying to hook our anchor back onto the Titanic. And when we look this week, the choice naturally is to have a sensible future relationship with the EU, to get our domestic agenda right, and to position ourselves globally. But we look this week to not use any economic jargon. I did a YouTube video the other week, and I was asked, just explain the Prime Minister's deal and no deal without using any technical terms at all. And I had to think of my favourite. So I said, OK, well, the Prime Minister's deal, with the backstop, is like allowing someone to put their hands around your throat and to squeeze the life out of your economy with them only letting go when they so choose. Yeah. No deal is like a kick in the groin. <laughs> it depends on how hard the other side wants to kick you, and it depends on how you position yourself. In the worst case, it's painful, but it's temporary. In the best case, you position yourself so that you avoid all of what you fear the most. The challenge with No Deal is that, at the moment, much of the planning is opaque. Those firms that have been open say they're prepared for it. We don't know yet how prepared the government is. So there could be some dislocation, but it is temporary and it avoids the alternative. So to look ahead, I would say, to make a success of leaving the EU, we need to get three things right. Our domestic agenda, our relationship with the EU, and our position globally. A budget for Brexit is needed to help get our domestic agenda right. And as Liam and I mentioned in the book, Clean Brexit, good economics is good politics. And in our view, the economics will be far better once we have left the European Union. Thank you.